every fetch application is basically the same. Or at least that's what I thought until I discovered this application, where this brave soul stepped into uncharted lands and made one fetch, which is a totally unassuming name, which is probably why I never heard of it, which takes the idea of Neo fetch and then applies it to a git repo. So as we see here, running it is basically the same way as Neo fetch. And while this repo has every bit of information that's going to be shown, if we go to a repo that doesn't, for example, my website, which I didn't put a license on because I just don't care enough to do so, it will actually go and hide any information that wasn't going to need to be there. But if there is any information we don't want to see, let's say we don't care about the license and then the repo size, we can go and hide that with the dash D option. Now, the documentation doesn't actually list out what each of the things are actually called. So the best way to find those names is by running one fetch dash D and then passing in an incorrect value. So as we can see, license is this one here and then also size. So one fetch dash D license, make sure you spell that correctly and then space whatever other things you want to hide. And there we go. Now, while this view is certainly nice to look at, maybe you just want the information being shown. And sure, you could go and parse it out manually, or what we can do is pass in the dash O option, then we can go and convert the data into either JSON or into YAML. This actually is really useful for an application like this, as opposed to NeoFetch. So NeoFetch, the problem with that is most of the information doesn't really change. Sure, your number of packages will change, your amount of time you've had your system on for, and that's basically it. The other ones change at such a slow rate that it doesn't really matter. Here though, a lot of this information is gonna change day by day, especially for a project that's actually being worked on. As you can see here, there's a list of languages in the project. And by default, the logo you're going to see is always going to be the primary language. So in the case of Ranger, that is going to be Python. But if you want to go and change it to another logo being shown, first you need to find out what languages are supported. So some languages may not show up in this list. But from my experience, any languages that are supported on GitHub and things like that are also going to be supported in this application as well. So pretty much everything that people actually use, even fairly uncommon languages like Holy C, for example. So to change the logo, what we need to do is run one fetch dash A and then pass in the language. Let's use something like Perl, for example, because I have not seen the Perl logo. And right, <laughs> I've got Perl's logo is a camel and it looks how the logo should look. Also, you probably noticed the color scheme of the text is dependent on the logo currently in use. So because the logo for Perl is cyan, the text is cyan. If we go to Ruby, now the text is red. While the information you see here might make it seem like it connects to things like GitHub or GitLab, because the information here is very similar to what you see over on those services, that's not what it's doing. All of this information here is going to be calculated locally. So for larger projects, things like say, you know, the Linux kernel or GIMP or things like that, it might take a little bit of time to actually run this. For anything reasonably sized though, the things that you're generally going to be working on, at least on my system, it runs pretty much straight away. But because it doesn't connect to those services, that does mean that you won't see things like the number of issues, the number of pull requests, and that information would be incredibly useful, but there are other tools that will get you that information. While this is the information you are shown out of the box, there is a way to modify or maybe expand the context is a better way to describe it. For example, with the authors, as we can see from the contributors number here, there is far more than three authors of this project but it's only showing the top three. So passing in the dash A option allows us to change the number of authors being shown. So for example, let's show the top 10 authors. Now we can see some of them go down to 
less than 1%. It doesn't show a fractional number, so obviously it's not actually 0%. Or maybe we want to see the email addresses associated with these contributors. That can be done by passing in the dash capital E option, and not every account is always going to have an email address associated with it, or a valid email address or anything like that, because Git doesn't really check that, but generally you're going to see something. And any timestamps you see are going to be in a simplified human readable format. For example, this project was created 12 years ago, or the last change was two weeks ago. Obviously, these are not very specific timeframes, but it does give you a general idea. But if you want to have a specific value, that can be done by passing in the dash Z option for an ISO timestamp. One thing you've possibly noticed is even though this is going over the entire Git repo and all of the folders recursively inside of it, the numbers you're seeing here make general sense from the project you're looking at. For example, Ranger has 16,000 lines of code. It has 157 files. These make sense if you've looked at the Ranger project before. So the reason why I'm mentioning this is because certain directories and certain files are going to be excluded. So the license isn't included in the number of lines of code. The readme isn't included in the number of lines of code. The .git directory isn't included in the number of files. What's included by default is good enough for most projects. But if you want to change what's being excluded, if we pass in the dash lowercase e option, we can list out files and directories that we want to exclude from all of the calculations. The other option we have is the dash dash hidden option, and by default, hidden directories are going to be skipped, because generally hidden directories are where you have things like, you know, uh, environment variables, maybe you'll put your database there, things you want to use for testing, you're not really going to want that to be in the Git repo itself. So there's not really any reason to actually include that. So it doesn't by default, but running this option will include those. While I mentioned changing the logo earlier, I was specifically talking about ASCII logos because ASCII logos work on every terminal on the planet if it is able to render text. But maybe you don't want to have just an ASCII logo. Maybe like with NeoFetch, you want to have an actual image. Now this is going to be very terminal dependent and many out there are not going to support this. So the supported backends right now we can check by using dash dash image dash backend, passing in an incorrect value. And right now, iTerm, which is the macOS terminal, Kitty, which has its own image rendering system, and then Sixel terminals. Uh, there is a fork of Alacrity which supports Sixel, which I'm using right now. I believe ST supports Sixel and a bunch of other terminals do. But if you do find a terminal which supports one of these backends, you can select it with this option. By default, the option is going to be set to Sixel, so you don't have to use it if you're using anything that uses that. Then what we can do is pass in the dash I option and then the path to an image. For example, this image right here, which is the OBS logo, and it works the same way it works in NeoFetch. I'm not particularly a big fan of using images like this, but if you are, the option is available. Now the license value is one of those things I was kind of confused about when I first saw, because there's no way to easily just parse this out of the license text. We do know that generally the license is going to be in a file titled license, so that's a good first step. What I forgot is that licenses are fairly standard, so if you're using a copy-paste license like GPL v3, for example, it's pretty obvious to work out what that license actually is. One slight issue, though, is there's no easy way in the application itself to check which licenses are currently supported. You would think there would be an option in the help menu or something like that, but at this stage, there isn't. The only way to check which licenses are supported are by going to the source code and checking the parsers that are available. I would like something here, that would certainly be nice, but I haven't really run into any licenses which don't work. The licenses you generally see for code are going to be here, unless you're using some sort of custom, not proprietary license, it can still be an open source license, but some sort of custom license in that sense. Another one you may not understand how it's calculated is dependencies, and this isn't going to be there for a lot of projects out there. One of the supported languages though 
is going to be Python. So we can check the supported languages, or I guess the supported package managers, by passing in one fetch dash p, and we can see cargo, go modules, npm, pip, and pub. The reason why things like this can be here is because these are very standard ways to work out the dependencies for an application, obtain the dependencies for an application, and things like that. A language like C or C++, while there might be package managers out there, there's nothing standardized to the same level of something like pip. So by that logic, even if it is a language with a supported package manager, if it's, say, using system dependencies, those system dependencies will not be listed inside of this dependencies list. I would like there to be more standardized ways to handle this, but at this stage, that's definitely not going to happen. Now, when I mentioned at the start, I hadn't heard of this application. This application isn't new. It's been around for... I have no idea how long, but enough to have a 2.11 release and some changes that are 14 months old. So it's clearly been here for a bit, but the name OneFetch isn't really indicating what it actually is. When I saw OneFetch, I thought, oh, it's just another NeoFetch application, and probably just skipped it by. But because it has been around for a while, it is very easy to get your hands on. So there are packages on tons of distros out there. There is also a Windows version through Chocolatey and a macOS version through Homebrew. So you can use it basically any way you want. I wasn't planning to cover another Fetch application anytime soon because sure, there is a lot of them out there, but a lot of them are basically just projects to learn the language and don't do anything that exciting. But I don't hate the concept of a Fetch application if you apply it to a new domain. Git repos being one of them, but I'm sure there are plenty of other places where something like this could make sense. So let me know your thoughts in the comment section down below. Is this something you would ever actually go and use, or is this just a waste of more CPU cycles and a waste of developer effort? I would love to know. So if you like this video, I'm going to go and like the video, and if you really like the video and you want to become one of these amazing people over here, go check out my Patreon, subscribe to only Veripay, link in the description down below. I've got a podcast called Tech Over Tea available basically anywhere. I've got a gaming channel called Brew Robinson Plays, and that's going to be it for me, so I'm out.